Welcome to the lecture of process measurement at the boundaries. My name is Ralf Haut. I introduce you to the agenda of this lecture. The first chapter is uh, touching on new possibilities with high bandwidth radar. The next one, use of electromagnetic flow meters in the case of electrical interference potentials. And the last chapter is touching on measurement of mass flow at extremely high and cryogenic temperatures. Common applications for storage tanks are, for example, large storage tanks. You see on the upper right side somewhere examples of large storage tanks. Then large and narrow bulk tanks, lower right picture, you immediately discover that you have to have good directivity, high antenna gain, high sensitivity and high measuring dynamic because of the very large distance which has to be covered by the measurement instrument. Last but not least, tanks and modules. There is no picture on this slide. Very small tanks need even higher accuracy and very small blocking distance. You may find tanks of this sort in modular uh, production sites with smaller size which can be transported on a trailer for example. Now let's look at different antenna characteristics at different frequencies. One condition is the radar lobe should not interact with the container walls or installations in the tank. This requires better directivity. Let's look at the formula first. The aperture angle is approximately 70 degrees multiplied with the wavelength divided by the diameter of the aperture. You see in the small picture the diameter of the aperture at the exit of the antenna and the angle alpha which is defining the width of the lobe, of the radar lobe. At the graphics on the right side we have calculated the lobe diameters at a distance of 20 meters dependent from different center frequencies of the radar. At 5 GHz, the lobe diameter in 20 meters distance will be 20 meters. With this width of a lobe, you will possibly encounter parasite reflections. To get rid of this difficulty, the necessity is given to have a higher frequency in order to get a lower lobe diameter. 10 GHz will provide approximately 8 meters. 24 GHz will provide approximately 3 meters. 80 GHz will provide only one, approximately 1 meter of lobe diameter and 20 meters distance. This is a very good performance for very tall and slim tanks but also it helps when using smaller tanks. Generally, the bandwidth of a center frequency plays an even bigger role, bigger than we have just uh, estimated. To achieve higher resolution, reduce blocking distance, better accuracy and robustness, it can indeed only be achieved with advanced radar technology using higher bandwidth. There is a re relation between the bandwidth and the center frequency. Given, again there is a rule of thumb, given with this formula you see in the middle, the bandwidth is approximately 30% of the center frequency, of the initial frequency. So, with the example 80 gigahertz, the bandwidth can be up to 25 gigahertz. Again, this is not a scientific law, it's just a rule of thumb. 
Finally, knowing this, higher frequencies mean smaller antennas with specifications similar to those for antennas for lower frequencies or, under the big line, better antenna focus. Krone has developed, jointly with Ruhr Universität Bochum, a very specialized chip design, particularly targeting the process industry. This chip is suitable for two-wire measurement because the energy requirement is less than 500 milliwatts. It is including a fully integrated FMCW transceiver, frequency modulated continuous wave transceiver, and is performing a bandwidth of up to 25 gigahertz. A picture you see on the left bottom of this slide and also magnification the two pictures to the right. Particularly developed for the process industry, it is not taken from other industries like the car industry. It's particularly developed for, the, for your industry. Let's have a further look on the possibilities you have with center frequencies and bandwidth. Let's take a very simple instrument with a center frequency of 6 GHz, typically used in the process industry today. There you will find a bandwidth of 1 GHz. One representative of this will be the Krone OptiWave 1010 instrument. At 10 GHz center frequency, you will probably find a bandwidth of 1.5 GHz. Not much more is typically used in the industry by today. Our representative of Krone will be the OptiWave 5200. Next stage would be a center frequency of 24 GHz, where there is a bandwidth available of 2 GHz. 2 GHz is a little bit more than 1. It sounds like 2 times as much, but there is a lot more than just 2 times uh, the frequency or the bandwidth. We have with the 80 GHz instrument the possibility to use 25 GHz. There is a restricted band of the Federal Communications Commission only using the legal f bandwidth of 8 GHz. But if you compare now the red flashing area of 1 GHz bandwidth, you see how much more of possible information we can now use. On this slide, we want to demonstrate what the additional benefit is if you increase the bandwidth. For that purpose, we have designed an experiment where at 80 GHz center frequency, we use, first of all, this is the upper diagram, we use 1 GHz as a bandwidth, second diagram in the middle, 8 GHz, and third diagram on the bottom, 25 GHz. Let's start with the upper one. The upper diagram is indicating the 1 GHz bandwidth out of 80 GHz center frequency and the distance of 1.2 meters. 1.2 meters is frequently used in smaller tanks and in smaller tanks particularly you have the requirement to exactly have a resolution of the distance nearby the bottom of the tank and all the way through the top of the tank. So you want to have the full coverage of this small distance. With 1 GHz of bandwidth you see the signal strength or the amplitude uh, in this diagram and now my question is where is the radar target? In this diagram really there is a radar target. Can you find it? No. You can guess that somewhere in the area of 0.6 meters there is a radar target and you can guess that somewhere at 1.1 meters there may be a radar target. Under the line, you don't see exactly what's happening in your tank. This is not really accurate measurement. 
8 gigahertz, the middle diagram, what you see is a very particular peak at approximately 0.5 meters and one more at approximately 0.7 meters of distance and one more maybe somewhere above 1 and below 1.1 meters. This is already giving you an impression what the benefit could be of increasing the bandwidth. Please remember we have the same center frequency of 80 gigahertz used for this experiment. Only the bandwidth is expanded. And now we get to the lower diagram, 25 gigahertz, you see very discrete peaks at 0.5 meters, at 0.7 meters, and a number of peaks above 1 meter between 1 and 1.2 meters. This can be one, two or three radar targets. Now I have indicated where the real radar targets have been located. Get back please to one gigahertz, the upper diagram. Now you realize this is only guessing. One gigahertz does not tell you where the real radar targets are located. It's only guessing, to be honest. 8 gigahertz. It's a full fit already for the very distant two radar targets at 0.5 and 0.7 meters. And the two radar targets between 1 meter and 1.2 meters are not fully resolved at 8 gigahertz. But you have the information that close to each other there are two radar targets you cannot distinguish is it 1 or 2 at 8 gigahertz. Next step would be the full resolution 80 gigahertz center frequency 25 gigahertz radar would tell you the truth. Clearly you can identify the target at 0.5, the target at 0.7 approximately meters and the two targets at 1.1 meter and 1.1 something meters and there is also a small distortion because these two targets are not behind each other, they are not beside each other, they are located a little bit complicated. As you see in this experiment, I have shown you the real photograph of a small experiment we have done with real radar targets. And the two targets to the right between 1 meters distance and 1.2 meters distance are very complicated shifted to each other. Now you understand why there is an additional reflection. Generic radar with 1 gigahertz bandwidth can never tell you where these targets are. 8 gigahertz can. This is the current technology you can purchase. 25 is technically already possible by today. Finally, if you use this in smaller tanks, such as we have shown in this picture, example from Invite, Leverkusen, Germany, you can measure really the full tank distance in order to be able to use the filling of smaller tanks as well. Only radar devices with high bandwidth offer these advantages, high resolution, higher accuracy, reduced blocking distance. Additionally, you can have smaller antennas. Now we come to the second chapter, the use of electromagnetic flow meters in the case of electrical interference potentials. I'm talking of electric potentials. Typical fields of applications where these potentials may occur are electrolysis plants, galvanizing plants, handling of strong acids, or plants with cathodic protection. The example you see here, a chloralkali electrolysis, will really have most of the influences in this one sort of plant. You see the membrane electrolysis a part of the story more or less in the middle of the picture where the electrolyzer is 
and the electrolyzer is using direct current, in some cases with a strength of, with a current of 100,000 amperes in the main stream. These high currents are causing distortions ev everywhere in such plants. You can have currents, disturbing currents, you can have even potentials on other instruments due to non-proper grounding, due to leakage of some instrumentation, due to uh, other in influences of bad earthing or similar. Therefore, there are a lot of electrical requirements, particularly electrical safety. What always is needed is protective earth, then equipotential bonding. It is self-explaining because of what you have seen on the slide earlier. And also to get good protection and hazardous area. If there is an explosion risk, also electrical safety is one of the most important things to keep. And last but not least, the measuring performance is also requiring electrical connections in order to put down the measuring reference to a fixed reference potential. This can be done by grounding or you put it to a different potential which is not equal to ground. But usually the most easiest is grounding. What you see is already a taste of how we can do it today. The picture is showing traditional methods where there are connections to metallic pipes, electrically conductive pipes, and also connections to grounding rings, grounding rings and protective earth. We, Krone, we have simplified this to what we call virtual reference. As you see in the picture, it looks quite simple. Actually, it is quite simple. The typical situation, the traditional situation in the field you may remember, is shown on this picture, just an example. The necessary ground can be given by electrically conductive flanges, can be given by grounding rings, or can be provided by grounding electrodes in the instrument. This is redundant today. Selecting the option virtual reference helps you to save money and to have quick and easy installation of instrumentation, magnetic inductive flow meters. In order to explain this a, a little bit further, I show you the conventional grounding measures in different steps. So be aware, it's getting more complicated. Let's start. In this graphics, you see there is no connection between liquid and ground. Terminal 1, 2 and 3 are differently connected. Terminal 2 and Terminal 3 are the inputs for the amplifier and the ground of the amplifier is not connected. This is posing a few problems and is not recommendable. It's not recommendable because there can be a lot of disturbances to the amplifier. There will be bad signal to noise ratio and in order to circumvent problems by bad signal to noise, one of the steps already taken is, one of the measures already taken, is to connect the electrodes symmetrically to the amplifier. This is one step used already in this configuration. Let's have a look at the next possible configuration. You see the wiring is a little bit more complicated, but this is quite common to do this way. The sensor and the converter are now connected to protective earth. They are both on the same electrical potential and both are on the potential of earth. This is providing electrical safety. This is providing a given reference for the amplifier. The amplifier ground Terminal 1 in this picture is connected to protective earth. Next situation. 
we talk about metal pipelines where there is a connection between liquid and ground and you see in the picture that the metallic pipe is connected as well as the housing of the converter and the ground of the amplifier to the same potential, the potential of earth, protective earth. It can get a little bit more complicated in case you use grounding discs or grounding rings. Electrically, it's identical to the previous situation, except that now you have the grounding rings between the flanges and one more set of gaskets between the flanges. If you think of the number of gaskets, now you have four gaskets and two grounding rings. All of those have to be properly centered, properly mounted and properly fastened. And then you have the same electrical situation where all is on the same potential which is protective earth. Next situation. This is a smart step forward available in the market. This is the use of a grounding electrode. The grounding ele electrode is a cheaper way to provide ground potential to the flowing liquid. You see that in this picture the grounding electrode is connected to the pipe. The pipe is connected to protective earth. The amplifier and the amplifier housing is connected to protective earth. Only the measuring electrodes are separately wired. There is a third potential leak path introduced this way. This is posing a problem to the reliability of such instruments. Anyway, if there is still a potential on the flowing liquid, current can be flowing through the ground electrode and there is a risk of electro corrosion. And also, the sensor has to have the third electrode included in the electrical isolation inside every magnetic inductive flow meter. Remember, electromagnetic flow meters have to have an isolation inside the flow meter in order to protect from short circuit. Therefore, now we have a third hole in the instrument and the third hole is a reliability issue. It can leak. Next situation is much more tricky, smarter than before. The use of a reference electrode. The reference electrode is not connected to the sensor housing. Now, protective earth is connected to the converter housing and the sensor housing. Protective earth is no longer connected to the amplifier. The amplifier gets the measuring reference from the reference electrode, again, which is not connected to the housing. And this picture a little bit tricky to see, but there is no connection between them. Still, there is a third potential leak path. But in terms of measurement, one advantage is there. You always have the amplifier on the potential of the flowing liquid. And there is no potential electro corrosion because there is no potential difference possible between the reference and the amplifier and earth. And therefore, the reference electrode has the advantage of missing electro corrosion. Chemical corrosion can still occur. The third leak path will remain. Next step, virtual reference. One more step in development done by Krone. The reference potential is made up of the measuring electrodes, terminal 2 and terminal 3. What you see is there is no longer a third leak path possible, only we are using the two electrodes which we use anyway. If we want to measure a voltage, the two electrodes have to be there. This is a given with the magnetic inductive flow meters. But these are also used to put the amplifier on the potential of the flowing liquid. There is an electronic PCB developed by Krone 
available at Krona only, which is called virtual reference, where the measuring electrodes are also providing the reference potential to the amplifier. What are the benefits? Outstanding measurement performance, very reasonable price, no longer four gaskets, now only two gaskets, fewer possible leak paths, and easy to mount and align and center. Please don't forget four gaskets and two grounding rings. This was the initial situation, are very difficult to align once you have everything loose, loosely mounted, centering takes another half an hour to get the instrument really running. And if there is a distortion in the flow, the measurement quality will be destroyed as well. So this is providing easy mounting and outstanding measurement performance at the same time. There is one more big advantage if you do that. Virtual reference saves money. How can it? You know, grounding rings cost money. You see a little list of grounding ring prices, prices of pairs of grounding rings. Nominal diameter 50 millimeters or 2 inch. The price of tantalum grounding rings would be more than 1200 euros. Titanium, more than 600 euros. And even Hastelloy C4, more than 300 euros. Let's get back to the tantalum situation. 1,200 euros at 50 millimeters, 2 inch size. This is not really a big magnetic inductive flow meter. The price of tantalum grounding rings can easily increase the price of the whole instrument. Virtual reference is 129 euros. The benefit is not only the pricing, the benefit is the pricing, the ease of mounting and the electrical measuring performance. There are no additional leak paths anymore and disturbances of flow can be ruled out this way. The third chapter is the measurement of mass flow at extremely high and cryogenic temperatures. This is a picture of a typical chemical factory. There are measurements at extremely high temperatures. For example, naphthalene mixture at plus 400 degrees centigrade or extremely cold liquids. For example, nitrogen at minus 106, 196 degrees centigrade. For these measurements, Krone can provide a lot of different solutions. Let's have a quick overview over the standard mass flow meters Krone can provide. They will cover a temperature range of minus 200 degrees centigrade up to plus 400 degrees centigrade. Certainly, there are optional heating or insulating jackets for the twin tube meters, there are optimized flow splitters for minimum pressure loss and very important the EGM and trained gas management for all converters in the 400 series. On this picture we show you the Optimas 1400 which is a straight tube twin tube meter, the Optimas 2400 to the lower right which is again a straight tube meter and a single straight tube meter, the Optima 7400 and then for very low flows the Optima 3400. Now I'm going to concentrate on the Optima 6400 which is the most recent meter. It's a twin bent tube meter which is covering the whole temperature range in different variants. Let's start with the variant for very cold applications. In this case, the measurement of liquid nitrogen with the Optima 6400. The liquid nitrogen is to be measured for determining the pump capacity curve of specialized pumps 
for extremely cold media, particularly liquid nitrogen. In this field test you see on the picture, the flow meters have to work with liquid nitrogen. As I said, minus 196 degrees centigrade. There is a little bit ice already on the outside of the instruments, on the flanges, because of the humidity condensing and freezing on the outside of the instrument. Also, in the picture you see rupture discs. You don't see them. They are connected to the front outlet of the housing. You see the small pipe coming out of the housing to the front and they are connected to rupture discs in order to make sure if there is a quick pressure in quick pressure increase in the housing that it will be still safe. This is common for use in liquid gas, liquefied gas applications. The two instruments are both Optima 6400 field with separate converter housing and both are nominal diameter 80 millimeters and they have pressure ratings of 160 on the left side and 40 bars on the right side. Different housings. The right side is an older generation of the 6400. This is the situation of the field test on a customer site. This customer finally has purchased the devices following to this field test. They are now able to really determine the pump capacity and performance curve of the pumps. You see a little bit in the background in green painting. Uh, now they can measure much quicker the performance curve of the pumps with high accuracy. Before they were using differential pressure measurements, they have replaced them because the Coriolis meters cover the entire measuring range at this very low temperature, where differential pressure measurements can only cover always a fraction of the whole range. The deviation of the Coriolis measurements from the differential pressure measurements was so small, it was even negligible, that they have decided to switch over to Coriolis mass flow meters. This is a solution with one standard device, the standard device Optimus 6400F. Now let's get to the hot end of a factory. The picture is thanks to Nina's refinery in Nina's Hem, somewhere in Sweden, where they have a trial for Coriolis mass flow meter for control and optimization of the reflux of a distillation unit. This mass flow meter is in place for a slop measurement at temperatures up to plus 400 degrees centigrade. The slop oil is a highly viscous liquid, usually at cold temperatures, with sometimes caustic components, which is very much depending on the quality of the crude it is based on. It is a reprocessing unit to increase the plant efficiency. The solution you see on the picture to the right is a thermal insulated 6400 mass flow meter, Coriolis mass flow meter, with a separate converter to the right lower corner of the picture. You can see a part of the converter. And the measurement range, temperature range, will be starting from 320 degrees C up to 400 degrees C at a pressure of 3.5 bars gauge. Flow rate 270 to 16,000 kilograms per hour. At uh, this temperature, the viscosity is 5 centistokes. Our customer provided a very excellent feedback. It was excellent in terms of functionality of the instrument, accuracy of the instrument, repeatability, please remember, very high temperature and rough situation in this plant, and excellent resolution and reliability. Certainly the customer has purchased the instrument, but the customer has now a very successful solution 
to upgrade this distillation unit to save thermal power and also to improve the efficiency of the distillation unit. The distillation unit does not have to be expanded. An expansion is not possible. With a given unit, they can have a better efficiency and can produce more of their product. Let's have a quick summary. The three chapters we have been talking about Radar, how is radar becoming more accurate and more robust by higher bandwidth. A bandwidth of 1 gigahertz was not really performing well. 8 gigahertz are already significantly better and 24 slash 25 gigahertz are the top possibility you can choose. We have been talking about high interference potentials and how they can be handled cost-effectively and safely. Virtual reference is your solution. And we have been talking about Coriolis mass flow meters at extreme product temperatures. We have, with those, enabled efficient process control. And remember, the distillation unit, the efficiency could be increased just by use of this flow meter. For illustration, you see a picture to your right. Again, it's a standard measuring device here on a seagoing vessel. Very icy situation. I think it's in the north part of our hemisphere, very north. This was the lecture Process Measurement Technology at the Boundaries. Thank you for your attention.